Good morning. If people could go to their seats in about one minute, we're going to go ahead and get started. So pick where you'd like to sit, please. Well, good morning. We are glad you're here. You braved the weather. I've had several people tell me we know you have when the West Michigan Healthcare Economic Forecast is because there's going to be bad weather. And I agree, we have had that. But thank you for braving the weather. We appreciate it. My name is Jean Nagelkirk, and I'm the Vice Provost for Health here at Grand Valley State University. Um, on behalf of the Seedman College of Business Alumni Association in my office, welcome to the ninth annual. West Michigan Healthcare Economic Forecast. We are we have the pleasure to have the, our president, Tom Haas, here from Grand Valley State University. Tom is a national and international leader in healthcare education. He has been a strong supporter of expanding existing programs and adding new select programs to meet the healthcare talent needs of our communities. And he also is a strong community supporter. Please help me welcome President Haas. Oh, well, good morning, everyone. Happy New Year. I think we can still say that until Valentine's Day. 
So, but then it is great, and Gene was saying that we're going to probably have uh, around 500 people uh, here uh, uh, through the morning, and I really appreciate uh, you all uh, braving a uh, little uh, uh, snow, ice, wind, uh, freezing rain. It is definitely, as Gene was saying, that time of the year. But uh, this is uh, great to, to have you here uh, as we continue our dialogue on a very important, uh, not just local, but we are going to focus in the local uh, aspects of healthcare and, and the forecast thereof, but also in the, in, in the national scene as well, because you can uh, look at any news outlet on any particular day, and there's going to be some kind of coverage or opinion or analysis about healthcare and healthcare delivery and insurance and you name it, it's going to be there right in front of us. And of course, it uh, plays uh, very well into uh, then uh, policies that uh, would go forward uh, with uh, those discussions and debates. So the, here we are again with uh, the ninth. Uh, next year will be the tenth. We'll celebrate the, that particular decennial, I am sure. But uh, again, as Jean was pointed out, that uh, this is. Uh, sponsored uh, with her office and also the Seidman Business Alumni Association. But we also have uh, some sponsors uh, for this and you can see them up on the uh, overhead with Blue Cross uh, Blue Shield of Michigan, Blue Care Network and Priority Health. So uh, thank them for their support. So this particular uh, healthcare checkup, so to speak, uh, is uh, looking at the trends in uh, uh, Kent, Ottawa, Muskegon, and Allen counties. And uh, the results of uh, their efforts are going to be presented by two of our, our faculty members in the economics uh, program, too. And what, uh, what I really want to share with you just for a minute is that uh, this particular uh, focus, and you can see the representation in this room of the uh, diverse nature of healthcare providers and interests, uh, the different organizations that are uh, coming together here to, to look ahead and hopefully then influence some of their decisions strategically in helping them uh, uh, take care of their mission and therefore taking care of the health of our community. And so what we are doing here with Gene's leadership uh, is to provide a catalyst in that uh, area by bringing administrators and professionals and business executives, uh, government uh, leaders, uh, community members, and to look at some of the challenges and, and uh, look ahead, as I mentioned. I think that's uh, probably the most uh, critical part of this, in addition to the networking that goes on here. Each year I've uh, seen this uh, particular program grow, and the conversations uh, had over a cup of coffee uh, are wonderful because those connections are being made. And when I talk about collaborations, uh, that really is in our DNA in West Michigan, as we know, time and again, because it does uh, fuel the quality of life that we have here. So what we then hope to have is with uh, our input is to help to drive those policies so uh, that we can improve the health of our communities. And Grand Valley uh, itself, for now for many years, has uh, continued its uh, strategic focus on nursing and on health professional development, the talent necessary within that, within that space. We have uh, uh, over 25,000 students, and about 9,000 of them are studying in some health care nursing or related to health care disciplines. And what I'm saying with that focus is we are trying to provide the relevant talent necessary for you all to carry out your, your particular mission. And that's the future workforce that we're trying to provide here. That, that's our, our particular focus here at, at the university. And I talk about collaboration. Just yesterday, for instance, uh, we were uh, up on the Medical Mile uh, in the Cook DeVos, and we were able to uh, ink a partnership uh, that uh, really goes uh, for decades, actually, with Mary Freebed, but now we are jointly sponsoring a mobility lab. Uh, so with that, we will help the clinicians uh, understand uh, uh, their uh, new tools that they have available to them and do the research associated with it. And then in turn, that research informs the healthcare needs for uh, our population. Those that are gonna be coming as patients and also those that are going to be studying for PT, for instance, at 
Grand Valley State University and get their clinicals, maybe at Mary Freeman, maybe just stay right here after the fact. And that's what our hope is too, because we want to keep the best and brightest right here to improve the health care delivery systems that we are fueling here at the, at the university. So we will continue to serve in that area and look at the continued collaborations and, and partnerships. And we do that with so many of you all in this room right now. So just to, uh, to the finish up that uh, at the university, again, our core mission is to shape student lives, professions, and society. And this particular event year over year now, I think, is helping us achieve that mission. It's our core business to improve society, to make a difference in society by way of the type of talent that we are shaping, that we are producing for you all, and in turn for the rest of this region. And I would uh, say for the rest of the state and nation as well, because our reach now goes throughout the nation. And in fact, I've seen some of our graduates now go back to their countries and serve in their healthcare facilities too. It could be in the UK, it could be Ghana. But these are the individuals that have been trained, been educated here at the university, but then receive a lot of influence by virtue of the partnerships we have for the clinicals that are here as well. So one last note, we, we're going to continue to invest in this space. Uh, we have uh, numbers of new programming that are going to come on board in the next five years uh, uh, in the uh, health uh, uh, professions. Uh, nursing continues to be very, very strong for us as well. We're investing in the Raleigh J. Finkelstein Hall. You can see that now north of the Ford Freeway in the Belknap neighborhood. We're working with our neighbors there. We're working with the city in, in a, again, a collaborative uh, format. And we are thrilled that that's going to be operational in May of this year. And so that has been a dream of ours uh, to help uh, give the tools to the faculty and to the staff and influenced and informed by, with great advice by our community. And then right next door to the Cook DeVos at 333 Michigan, uh, we have a placeholder from the state. They're going to invest in Grand Valley, but more importantly, in the, they're investing in Grand Rapids in West Michigan, and we'll put a third facility there. And that's going to provide a very high-tech, high-touch opportunity for our students and faculty and working with our healthcare providers and others as well. And that uh, will hopefully uh, start uh, construction on that with the vision that I have of it being operational by the, uh, in 2021. Now, that's not that far away. But what we think then at the, in 2021, we will have uh, these three facilities all working uh, really synergistically with the programming, with the providers and others so that we can continue to reap the benefits of our, of our, um, of our investments. So I just want to say thank you for, for coming. Thank you for your interest in, in this particular topic and in Grand Valley State University. I wish you safe travels back to your office or back home um, through the uh, rest of the day. And have a great weekend, too. So thank you all. Thank you, President Haas. Being the leader, pro leading provider of health professionals for the region, we are so thrilled to host this, this forum to learn more about the healthcare trends, to learn about some research, and hear from our panelists what will happen in the future. I also want to, as Tom said, we have over 9,000 students in one of our health or health-related programs, so we want to thank you today for either being a preceptor or someone in your organi organization being a preceptor for our clinical students, for being a research mentor, or just providing a lecture. We really appreciate that because we have over 2,600 students out there in clinical placements. And those students, we want to prepare appropriately because they will provide the quality, cost-effective care that we come to, to need and to, for our citizens. So thank you again. Um, I also want to recognize a couple individuals if they're here. Um, Tom mentioned we had Blue Cross and Blue Shield and Party Health and Blue Care Network. 
two people kind of lead that for Blue Cross and Blue Shield. It's David Brown. He's in the back, if you could raise your hand. He leads the team to give us the data so we can do the research. And Jan Yu, I don't know if she's here, right here. If you could stand up real quick. She's from Priority Health, and she helps get the data and help us with that. So thank you for the that. I'd also like to thank Diane Dykstra in the back. She kind of manages the event and makes sure that health care publication gets done. So thank you, Diane. Um, and this morning, what we are going to do, we're going to have two professors of economics discuss the research that they've done, one on the research from the data and one on a survey. Then we will have a um, panel, three panelists, who will give us their perspective from their industry and what's going to happen in the future from their areas. I do want to mention that we are live streaming. So for those of you who are listening to this, you can go to the Office of the Vice Provost for Health website and under the publication tab, you can get the health check, which we all have in our seats. I would also like each of you to note there is cards, index cards where you are sitting. If you have a pen, you can jot any questions you have for the researchers. Just before they're finished, you'll see event staff walking around getting those and giving to them, them so that they can answer some questions. So now I'm going to give a very brief bio for each of these individuals because we'd rather hear from them than listen to all their major accomplishments. But Kevin Callison is an assistant professor at Tulane School of Public Health and tropical medicine in the Department of Economics. Prior to his appointment in Tulane, we had him here for three years in our economic department, so <laughs> he's our very own. Um, he also does significant research on health insurance and policy evaluation. Leslie Mueller is our assistant professor of economics here at the Seidman College of Business. She is responsible, of course, for the survey portion today. Leslie earned her PhD in economics from Michigan State University. She has worked as a senior pension e economist in the Social Security Administration in Washington, D.C. And her research interests are pensions, health insurance, and uh, public policy. Kevin? All right, well, thank you for coming this morning. We're, we're very excited to present our results of, of the, the new health check for this year. As President Haas said, we've been doing this for a number of years now, and through the collection of, of both primary and secondary data, I think we've put together, at, at this point, a, a pretty nice trend of changes in healthcare expenditures and, and healthcare use in West Michigan. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some, some population health measures, also some spending in healthcare use. Uh, Leslie will talk about a couple of local community surveys with employers and, and both individuals asking about you know, things, things to do with their, their health insurance and their experiences over the past year. So first of all, just a, a couple of, of quick trends in, in some of these population health metrics. Um, these data are for the state of Michigan. In the past, we'd been able to compare the east side and the west side of the state, but unfortunately, the, the data were changed this year, and, and we're, we're forced to look at the entire state of Michigan. So this is the trend in, in heavy drinking. Uh, this is defined as two or more drinks per day. Um, and you can see it's, it's been relatively flat at about 7% of the population is, is classified using this definition of, of heavy drinking. So we, we don't see uh, large changes there. Where we do see some bigger changes are in some other risk factors. Uh, smoking, for example, the, the share of the population in Michigan that, that is a, a current smoker has fallen uh, to about 20% of the population. That's still higher than the national average, which is somewhere around 15, 16%. Um, so we, you know, we could, th there's some work to be done there in terms of, of addressing risk factors associated with higher healthcare expenditures. But the trend is, is nice. It's good to see that that, that trend is falling. Um, on the other hand, this is the uh, trend in obesity in the state of Michigan, and that's sort of moving in the wrong direction. So we've, uh, we're over, uh, getting close to about 35% of the population that's calculated, or that, uh, that falls under the classification of obese, which is uh, your body mass index uh, greater than 30. Um, if you combine the share of the people in the population who are obese with the people who are considered to be overweight, that's a, a little more than two-thirds of the population of the state. So that's a real uh, challenge, and we know that, that overweight and obesity is, is also associated with higher medical spending, so this is another area that, that could potentially be uh, addressed. Uh, shifting focus a little bit from these, these risk, population risk factors to, to 
to health insurance, uh, this is where we've seen really, really significant changes over the past few years, and, and no one should be surprised because you know, the Affordable Care Act had, had pretty significant implications for the, the share of the population that had health insurance. So this is the population between the ages of 18 and 64. So this doesn't include people who are you know, traditionally on Medicare or, or children who might be on the, the CHIP program or, or Medicaid. Um, you know, this is that, that 18 to 64 population. Um, in, in 2011, we had about 18% of the state in this age range who did not have health insurance. And by 2016, that was down below 10%, which is the first time we've seen numbers that low for, for this group in the state. And you can, you can see the break in the trend there. This is clearly coming because of the, the Medicaid expansion and the, the establishment of the exchanges under the ACA. Um, it's gonna be interesting to, to follow this trend over uh, the next few years because there are you know, things like the repeal of the individual mandate and things that are happening that are probably going to either flatten this line out or maybe make it start, you know, start trending in the opposite direction, upward instead of downward. So this is gonna be something we wanna keep an eye on, but we've seen the effects of, of what this reduction in the uninsurance rate has done. And you know, if you look at some of these metrics that should respond to insurance, like for example, do you have access to healthcare? So this is the share of the population in the state that, that says they have no access to health care because it's too costly. And you can see that's fallen. I mean, it's still higher than we'd like it to be. It's still about 13% of the population, but that's down from more than 16% a few years ago. So we're making progress there. Um, also, have you had a routine checkup in the past year? Or I'm sorry, this is, have you not had a routine checkup in the past year? And, and you see that number falling, which is good as well. Pe more people are able to, to access care, fewer barriers to accessing care. Um, so the, this is probably a direct result of that increase in, in insurance coverage. And uh, like I said, it's gonna be interesting to see where these go in the next few years with all the changes that are happening to the, to the Affordable Care Act. Health status here, are you in fair or poor health? So even though more people are insured, more people are going to the doctor, Unfortunately, they're not reporting better health. So now, you know, this could be because of things like the, the change in the risk factors that we saw. Um, but whatever the reason, it doesn't look like that increased access, at least in self-reported health, is, is generating these large improvements that we would like to see. So pretty flat there for being in fair or poor health. Okay, one thing we like to do with this, the, this project is to compare the Grand Rapids market to other similar communities. Um, so we've, we've taken Grand Rapids and using data on hospital use, we've, we've looked at the Grand Rapids region, we compare it to Detroit this year, to the rest of the US, so looking at the national average, and then also to what we call in this picture a benchmark. And that benchmark is the population weighted average of four different metro areas, so Milwaukee, uh, Louisville, Rochester, New York, and Buffalo. And those areas demographically are fairly similar to, to Grand Rapids. So those benchmark comparison communities are communities that we think look a lot like Grand Rapids in terms of, of demographics. Uh, Grand Rapids in this picture is the dark blue line, and this is showing you hospital admissions per capita. You can see that in Grand Rapids, we have far fewer hospital admissions per capita than, than the country as a whole, than certainly than Detroit, and, and then compared to our, our benchmark communities as well. This is the, the outcome that, that has been very interesting to track over the past couple of years. This is called outpatient visits to hospitals. And the name is a little deceiving. Um, you can see Grand Rapids and Detroit both have, have very high rates of what is called outpatient visits to hospitals. Much higher than the benchmark communities and much, much higher than the national average. We've gone back and forth about potential causes for this, but we, we've, one thing that we think is driving this is sort of an accounting trend that the, uh, when, when providers align themselves with hospitals, they're able to charge as if they were an outpatient hospital facility. And when this data comes from the American Hospital Association and they instruct reporters in this data if you are an outpatient hospital facility to report a visit as an outpatient visit. So what this means is it's not probably indicative of more people going to hospitals to use outpatient care, it's probably more indicative of the alignment between hospitals and, and providers, and that's changing the way that, that, uh, that patients are billed. Uh, ED visits, this is another area where you, know, you, you look to as a driver of cost. Um, Grand Rapids looks pretty good here. We're right in line with the national average and with our, our benchmark regions, Detroit is, you know, that, that's a, a major problem area for Detroit is this, the, these emergency admissions. Um, 
Medicare expenditures, so you know, Grand Rapids has a, a, a long-standing reputation as being a, a low-cost place for, for health care, and that does still look to be true when we look at overall Medicare spending, which is really kind of the best measure of, of overall spending in health care. Um, you can see that you know, Detroit in, is, is fairly high here in terms of, of Medicare spending above the national average. Uh, Grand Rapids, we're right in line with our benchmark communities and below the national average in terms of Medicare expenditures. And then lastly, I always like to show, show some outcome that relates to the quality of care we're getting. And this year, I, I chose this discharges for ambulatory care sensitive conditions. So what this means is if you, if you arrive at the hospital and you're admitted to the hospital for an ambulatory care sensitive condition, that's seen as an inefficient uh, way to provide care. So you want to be, you want to have a low number in this picture, and Grand Rapids does. This, this is used as a, a common measure of, of the quality of care that you're getting, the efficiency of care you're getting in a community, and, and we look pretty good here. We're, we're lower than the national average, lower than our benchmark communities, which is where we want to be. Okay, so now I'll, I'll turn to some more local measures of, of cost and expenditures. This is using data from Priority Health, Blue Cross Blue Shield, and Blue Care Network. Um, we've, we've been using these data for several years now, and I, we, we've started to put together a nice trend to, to show what's happening with expenditures in the region. And we've consistently kind of focused on these, these six chronic conditions. So we have asthma, uh, heart disease, coronary artery disease, depression, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, uh, low back pain, and then we have people who are considered healthy. These are people between the ages of 30 and 39 who do not have a diagnosis of one of those other six conditions. Uh, we have have now five years of pretty consistent data tracking expenditures for these groups. Uh, there's a gap in that data. That gap is because of the Affordable Care Act. The Medicaid expansion and the, the creation of the exchanges happened there. Now these are data for privately insured people, no Medicaid, no Medicare, but we still want to separate out the pre and post ACA. Uh, one of the kind of most noticeable trends here is the increase in expenditures for coronary artery disease or heart disease. So in, in a few short years, we've gone from the average patient with heart disease in, in West Michigan spending about sixteen, seventeen thousand dollars a year. Now we're we're pushing about $30,000 a year for that patient in a relatively short time. I think it's something like a 40% increase over the past five years. So, I mean, this is an area that, that is really, I think, important to keep an eye on in, in, in trying to determine what's happening with, with expenditure trends in, in West Michigan. Um, if you look at expenditures between the east and west side of the state, so in the dark blue columns there, that's Kent, Ottawa, Muskegon, and Allegan counties. The light blue is the Detroit region. I think this is now the third year in a row that we've seen spending on coronary artery disease uh, on average higher on the west side of the state than on the east side of the state. And as you can see with those other measures, that's not common. Most of these other conditions, well, all of these other conditions we're looking at, uh, spending tends to be higher on the east side of the state. Now, the spending is a combination of, of things like the, the service intensity, the price of care, the, the patient's health, you know, if patients are uh, becoming more frail or, or sicker, that could lead to higher expenditures. So we don't exactly know why these expenditures are, are rising, especially for heart disease in the way that they are, but it's an interesting trend that's happening now that it's more expensive on the west side of the state than the east side of the state. Um, in, in terms of the other outcomes, though, uh, the spending in the Detroit region is, is higher. So here's the, the percentage change from last year to this year in average expenditures. And there are, are two areas that stand out here. Again, back to that, that heart disease, we've seen uh, almost 9% increase in expenditures from 2015 to 2016 in West Michigan for heart disease. Hyperlipidemia expenditures uh, also showed a big increase as well as asthma. So this is uh, kind of the, the year over year change that's making up those, those uh, total expenditure dollars. Uh, we did see expenditures for low back pain fall on the, the west side of the state. And if you look at those changes in spending for healthy members, uh, we saw pretty small increases in expenditures on the west side of the state compared to the east side of the state. All right, I'll turn it over to Leslie, and she's going to talk a little bit about her firm survey and the community survey. Is it here? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Hello, we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about two surveys today. The first is the firm survey. And this is the second year in a row that we've uh, partnered with the Employers Association of West Michigan and in, in uh, their uh, online firm survey. So thank you very much for your administration and collaboration of this survey. Okay, sample characteristics. Uh, we, it is an online survey. The characteristics are very similar to last year. So we had a 14% response rate, and because firms often offer more than one plan, uh, we had 75 firms but 138 plans. Firm size, uh, very, again, very similar as to last year. Uh, we have a little more than half of uh, relatively larger firms at 100 or more full-time employees. And then, uh, not surprisingly, in West Michigan, approximately half of these firms are in manufacturing. Okay, so looking at health insurance plans, the number of plans offered and the types of plans. So this year, we did have um, a lot more of the firms that are offering two or more plans. And so with our, um, those offering one plan, 52%, uh, last year it was a little over 60%. And so firms are giving more options to their employees. Now the types of plans offered, not surprisingly, we've seen an increase in high deductible plans. Last year, 68% of plans were high deductible, this year 75%. And unlike last year, we did see a decrease in one of the types of traditional plans, and that's gonna be the PPO. Last year, 40% of plans were traditional PPOs. This year, 36%. Now, we have seen a national trend in deductibles with uh, PPOs. If you look at those uh, increases in deductibles uh, com as compared to the deductibles in high deductible plan, high deductible plan deductibles have only risen about 1% whereas PPOs have risen by seven to eight percent as far as deductibles. So those deductibles are starting to catch up with high deductible plans, but remember, PPOs do have higher premiums than high deductible plans. So that, it's not a, a, a huge decrease, but we do, we, that may be one reason that we're seeing some decrease in these uh, PPO plans. Now this is looking just at high deductible plans, and so we wanted to uh, measure again the percentage of firms that are offering their employees only a high deductible plan. It stayed constant at exactly 42% from last year. Similarly, with the average annual deductible, not a lot of change from last year, and we also see those deductibles pretty much in line with national de uh, deductibles for high deductible plans. And finally, to tax-free savings accounts. Now, we've heard a lot, we, we tend to hear a lot about health savings accounts, HSAs, um, but we did notice that this year there's been a significant increase in the offering of uh, federal spend, or I'm sorry, um, flexible spending accounts and also health reimbursement accounts. So as far as the growth of uh, HSAs, given that an employer does offer a high deductible plan only up 1% from last year. So pretty much stable. However, with respect to HSAs, we do see a 10 percentage uh, point increase from last year with respect to firms that contribute to the HSA because they don't have to contribute. And so we've got almost two thirds of firms contributing. Now, finally looking at those flexible spending accounts and uh, health reimbursement accounts, last year a very small percentage of firms at 4% offered an HRA. That rose eight percentage points this year to 12%. And then the same, uh, approximately the same increase with F, uh, FSAs this, uh, this year, seven percentage point increase. Now, this could be due to the fact that we do see higher deductibles with these non-traditional plans, the non-high deductible plans, and so f because HSAs must be um, accompanied by a high deductible plan, they can't offer, firms can't offer HSAs for these, for instance, traditional PPOs. So they're starting to offer those types of uh, tax-free savings accounts that are not necessarily associated with a high deductible plan. Okay, now let's look at our community survey. Now we did a community, we've done a community survey for a couple of years, however this year um, we uh, benefited from a, of having a much higher sample size because the, the GVSU, Johnson Center for Philanthropy, 
offered to allow us to use their data. And so thank you very much to the Center for Philanthropy on allowing us to do this. And we, we have similar questions that we're able to ask. The survey sample, if you've heard of Voice GR, that uh, survey's been going on for a while. Well, this year they expanded that survey to all of Kent County. So it's now called the Voice Kent Survey. And so this was done in the summer and fall of 2017, so quite recently. Note that because there were still surveyors out in the field, when we needed this data, uh, we have only uh, a partial sample. <laughs> Of, of voice Kent. The sample size, about 2,300. Now, one thing to note when we get down to this uninsured rate at the bottom is that our sample includes those people age 65 and over. And almost everybody in that age range has Medicare. So they will be uh, considered uh, insured. Now, uh, the uninsured rate is quite a bit lower than what Kevin found at about 3%. Now, there are a couple of reasons for this difference. Uh, remember, his, his numbers were for the state of Michigan. This is just for Kent County. So we have the um, uninsured rate at 3%. We have, again, we have those people with Medicare included in there. And also, Kent County has quite a bit lower unemployment rate than the east side of the state. You have uh, less unemployment. You have more people that are covered by uh, insurance through work. Okay, so current health insurance status for those uninsured. So we have about half that remain uninsured if they were uninsured last year. Um, they remain uninsured in 2017. We primarily see Medicaid as the reason for those that did become insured this year. Now, this is these are very interesting. The next two slides, we did not have this um, ability to afford uh, health care and prescription drugs in our community survey. Now, we see here that there are separate questions about the ability to afford prescription drugs and health care. And what we see is that about a fifth of the sample says that they either cannot afford either of these at all or um, not very well. Okay, so we do have that term of underinsurance that was. Um, uh, cited by the, the Commonwealth Fund. And uh, that is talking about, okay, look, we have insurance, but people still have a lot of cost sharing, and they're still unable to afford their insurance. So we do have a fifth of those uh, Kent County residents that are in this situation. And then finally, barriers to getting care. This is also very interesting because we do see, and um, individuals were allowed to check whatever applied for them. So cost, almost 60% obviously said cost is a barrier to getting care. We also have the more of this convenience or the ability to get to the primary care office, uh, to get time off of work, the inability to uh, get child care as barriers to care. And so some ways to, to start to break down these barriers would be either in uh, physicians or these um, primary care facilities offering extended hours, non-traditional work hours, and also uh, e-medicine. You, you use telemedicine, your kids are still in the house, you hopefully can then uh, still hook up with a physician and um, discuss your conditions. Okay, so I think we, we have a, some time for questions. If you yes. You'll, we should uh, have people walking around grabbing questions if you wrote one out. One question that someone had in before we started, Kevin, sure. was under the coronary artery disease, what is included in that category? Open heart surgery or what type of thing? Yeah, there's, um, I don't know off the top of my head the listing. They, these are defined using, oh, yeah, thank you. Um, what, what makes up coronary artery disease? So, so what does that encompass? Um, it, it's a good question. We, we def use these uh, definitions, we create these definitions using uh, ICD-9, ICD-10 code. So I don't know, I can't tell you exactly what is in, what makes up that, that category. Um, we, can, we can certainly make the definitions available, though, online. Okay, so uh, 
one question says, are, are the demographics different enough between the east side and west side to drive up the increased COPD expenditures? Um, we've, we've been monitoring expenditures in, in this, for this condition, both on the east side and the west side of the state. And if you look at the levels, traditionally, well, prior to the last few years, the, the east side of the state had higher expenditures. And, and probably that, you know, part of that is the demographics, part of it is, is treatment style, part of it's prices, all these things factor in. But over the, if you look at the change over the last three or four years, the growth in those expenditures has been much higher on the west side of the state. So probably changes in demographics are explaining some of that higher growth. I don't know that they're explaining all of that higher growth. Um, unfortunately, we, you know, we, it's, it's hard for us to determine the reason, what's contributing to these changes in care given, given the, the data that we have. So uh, while we can track these trends over time and we can say, well, by, by holding the, the definition of, of coronary artery disease constant, we see these changes happening on the east side versus the west side of the state. It's uh, unfortunate that we can't really answer the question why that's happening. This is for you. Oh, okay. Uh, obesity, any intention to separate and evaluate obesity in the 18 and under population? Uh, it would be nice. We, the, the data that, data source we use for this only includes people over the age of 18. <laughs> So we, we don't have the data on the younger population, but if you look at trends in obesity rates in the, in the under 18 population, those are, aren't necessarily, they don't track necessarily with the trends in obesity in the over 18 population. So certainly there, there would be interesting differences there if we, if we were able to, to get the data to look at that. Okay, so this question says, do you have data on the spread or average deductibles for high deductible health plans? Uh, I believe the, the average deductibles were what I had put up online, if I'm understanding, I mean, up on the slide, if I'm understanding this uh, correctly. Otherwise, it, we, we, the question could be asking if we have uh, data on the difference between deductibles and high deductible plans and in traditional plans. Uh, if so, uh, we do have data on that. I just don't have it right here. Okay, so um, if the person that would like this data uh, comes and talks to me afterwards, we can, we can get that. Um, so th this is a really good question, and we've, we've had this question before, and I, it, it's unfortunate that we can't answer this, but would it be possible to study the, the number or percentage of, of dementia as that outgrows in, in cost other diagnoses? Um, the, the data that we, that we get on expenditures are for the privately insured population. We don't have Medicare claims data to be able to analyze that. So it's, you know, dementia tends to occur in the population over the age of 65. So there's not really, uh, we, we don't have the data on those, uh, on those people to be able to track that. Uh, we would love to, though, because, of course, that's, that's going to be interesting to look at those, the, the changes for that group. Okay, this question is, what are the trends in employer healthy worker programs? Um, we do not have that data from the Employer Association. I am not sure if they have that data as well, because they did uh, ask more questions in their survey, but we do not have them. Uh, so someone asked, is it for coronary artery disease, the increase, is it because it's more people or more expensive technology and care? It's not because it's more people. We're looking at per capita expenditures, so we're adjusting by the, you know, the expenditures per 1,000 people in the population. It very well could be because care is becoming more expensive or there is more you know, the, the treatment intensity is increasing, technology is improving, and that comes with a higher price tag. So there's a lot of reasons. It could be the shift the, the population is aging, the, the share of the population that is you know, in, in age 50 to 65 is growing. So it could be changes in the composition of, of the patients who, are, who are, have the disease. Um, we don't know for sure, but we do know that it's not a, just an overall increase in the number of people diagnosed with, with CAD. Okay, so this question is, are you seeing employers contemplating removing specialty drugs from their employer health plan? And I'm sorry to have to say this again, but we, we uh, do not have that data. We used to do an employer survey where we asked specific questions about how are you trying to cut costs, and that would be a, a good uh, question. Uh, but unfortunately, we did not ask that question on the survey. Um, it, this is a question about uh, one of the figures that, that we didn't show but is, is also interesting, uh, looking at total expenses per hospital admission. Uh, the question says, this is uh, figure nine, I think, in the benchmarking communities section. 
Uh, shows Grand Rapids had increased total hospital expenses per admission from 2010 to 2014. What factors contribute to such trends? Um, and then why a decrease in 2015? There was, a, I guess, a decrease in 2015. Um, I, I don't know exactly why we're, well, first of all, let me define what this means, uh, expense per hospital admission. The, the American Hospital Association defines this as basically the cost to a hospital of admitting a patient. So, so what is the average cost for a hospital? And we, that does tend to be a little bit higher in Grand Rapids than the national average and then our, our, our benchmark communities. Um, some explanations can be ruled out based on the data that we have. We look at total personnel expenses, and, and those are lower in Grand Rapids, hospital-based personnel expenses than other places, so it's not that. Um, it's, it, it could be because, it's probably not because of the, the over underlying health of the population. We tend to be a little bit healthier here than the rest of the country. So it, it could be because of the technology that's being used is a little bit more expensive. It could be because of you know, a number of reasons. Um, we, that, we, that we can't identify, but we can rule out a couple of those reasons. But it is an interesting trend to monitor the hospital expenses per admission. Uh, on the question of the spread between the deductibles for high deductible plans versus traditional plans, there actually is uh, data in Table 1, which is on page 52. I didn't have it off the top of my head, but as I am looking, um, we, see, we see that for traditional plans for single coverage, uh, $687. And then that's versus about $2,300 for high deductibles. And then family deductibles um, would be $1,400 versus 40, about $4,600. Now, remember, we did not have a, um, we don't have data, or, I'm sorry, we don't uh, have an increase in the HMO and PPO deductibles. So we also have those in there. Okay, so that, those, are ta those are an average of all of those types of plans that are in the book. One more question. I'll, I, I, I probably address this, but I, I, there are three or four up here asking about this increase in, in CAD expenditures. And, and again, we, we're not really sure why this is happening. We, um, we, we're able to, to monitor those changes, the growth in expenses, and you know, we can rule out some factors, but, but for the most part, it could be you know, all, most of the question, is it utilization, is it price? We, we just don't really know. We don't have the data to, to sort that out. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do our best to try and answer some of these questions in, in the future, but as of now, we, we can only say it's an area to, to monitor and, and continue to track. Thank you so much. I'm going to invite our panelists to come on up, and uh, we will get started with uh, the panelists. So I'm going to start talking about them so that they can get their seats. Um, we are going to have three expert panelists who will have 12 minutes each to share their vision for the future of healthcare from their role in industry perspective. Um, during their presentations, again, please use your index card, write the questions down, and we'll have event planners coming around and picking up those cards. Um, I could talk for a long time about each of them, but again, I'm gonna make it very short so they get to share their information we have put them in alphabetical order, so we will start and they will go one right after the other. I will first do all their bio sketches and then we'll go right that way. Some have PowerPoints and others uh, chose to just speak. The first presenter will be uh, Dr. Peter Hahn. He is a senior physician leader with extensive experience in service line development, strategic planning, physician engagement, and quality improvement. Dr. Hahn received his medical degree from the Michigan State University. He served in several leadership roles and was named Top Doc for Portland Monthly Magazine. He has published extensively and lectured extensively also. And he works at um, Metro Health. Irwin, uh, Wynn Irwin is the chairman of the board for Irwin Holding, Inc. He became president of Irwin Seating in 1984. He was the third president of the company's history, succeeding his father. William Irwin and his grandfather, Earl Irwin. Transitioning to the chair of the board on July 1st, 2015, after 31 years. Irwin Seating Company has a manufacturer of auditorium and theater seating for over 108 years. The company continues to be a family-held business with sales of approximately 110 billion. Wynn is very involved in the community and serves on several boards. Nick Lyon is the director of the Michigan Department of Health and Human Service. 
He earns a bachelor's degree in economics and political science from Yale University. He oversees daily departmental operations and represents the department with various stakeholders, the Michigan legislator and community partners. He oversees the department's interaction with multiple state offices and boards. Nick has been involved in a number of key health initiatives, including the successful implementation and management of the Healthy Michigan Plan and advancement of the health information technology in the state of Michigan. Dr. Hahn? Thank you, Jean. If I could pull up my slides here. Um, first of all, I want to apologize for paraphrasing Charles Darwin in West Michigan, but I think it was Darwin who said that it's really not the strongest who survive and thrive. It's not the smartest, but it's really the one who's the best adaptable to change. And I think that really applies to healthcare today. Um, oh, thank you. And uh, I did try to find some good John Calvin quotes, but there was a lot about, uh, <laughs> a lot about predestination and election, so it didn't quite strike the collaborative tone I wanted to strike here, but uh, <laughs> at any rate. Um, so opportunities and challenges. I think there's tremendous opportunities and significant challenges that face us as providers, payers, educators, um, and, and certainly the government as well. I'm going to just spend just maybe a minute on each of these and then sort of get to two that I think are extremely important. To, to carry this forward. But opportunities, population health, I think we definitely on the provider side recognize that we're now responsible for the total cost of care. And the sober realization that in terms of health outcomes, what we've traditionally focused on clinical medicine is maybe only responsible for, for about 10 to 20 percent of those outcomes. And a much bigger impact comes from social determinants like what Kevin and Leslie spoke to in terms of access to transportation, access to healthy foods. And I think that's an area that not only as a health system but as a community that we have a lot of opportunity to address. Value-based payments, regardless of what happens with, with reform, whether the ACA dies a slow death or, or what have you, I think value-based payments are here to stay. I think that's evident by, you know, the 92 to 8 passage of MACRA in the Senate. You know, last year was sort of a baby step for MACRA in terms of reporting. This is sort of the first real year where we're having to report MACRA uh, indices. By the way, I think somebody in the forum last year mentioned that uh, most physicians, most docs don't know how MACRA works. I would say that you know most docs don't know how a car works, but they still drive one, right? And so I think it's up to us as leaders to make sure that that, that works well. But value-based payments really is transforming the way we think about care delivery. Patient experience, certainly a significant opportunity. The golden rule used to be do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I think the platinum rule now is do unto others as they want. And so we're really focusing on patient experience. Um, and then I'll talk about the consumerism side on the other side of that. I think in terms of opportunities for me as a clinician, certainly personalized medicine is the most exciting. You know, as a pulmonologist uh, with an interest in lung cancer, there are patients alive today with advanced lung cancer that are getting molecular treatments that weren't available two, three years ago. And now we're at, uh, you know, looking at liquid biopsies to diagnose and stage lung cancer using blood samples, breath samples. And the true experts in personalized medicine would say that's not even personalized medicine. You know, personalized medicine is about genetic testing to diagnose and catch disease before it even happens. And using things like 3D printers to plan surgeries for specific patients and uh, maybe even design artificial organs or parts of organs. I think the, the last real opportunity is disruptors, right? I think as an industry, we tend to use the word disruption or disruptor probably too easily. I think a disruptor is something that really fundamentally changes your value stream and your value proposition as, as an industry or organization. But I think we are in a time of disruption. I think the potential mergers of a, you know, Aetna and CVS and, and uh, 
Optum's activities probably will change the way we look at primary care is my thought. So I think there are some disruptors coming by, you know, Amazon getting involved, et cetera. I think in terms of challenges, um, I think for us as a health system, certainly the cost mandate and margins with decreasing you know, public uh, funding with Medicare and Medicaid and just the market forces, we're, we're, we're tightening up our margins. It's, it's not easy. It, it is a struggle. And uh, I think the advisory board last year released uh, a study where, you know, in terms of hospitals that were getting both DISH and 340B payments, that 60% may have negative margins in 2025 unless they go undergo significant change. I think that's certainly an op a challenge. The healthcare labor market in West Michigan is a challenge, I think, for us in that uh, it is so low. Um, you know, we work closely with GBSU and um, there, there's, so, there's a lot of talent, but there's a lot of jobs, and uh, I think the, the labor market and the unemployment rate is, is a challenge for us. Consumerism, I'm, I'm sure Wynn and um, Nick will speak to a bit of the high deductible health plans, but what comes along with that too is uh, patients who forego care. There's significant seasonality to when they uh, look for care. And so that is a challenge for us as health systems. Um, and then, you know, certainly the opioid epidemic, the dementia epidemic, these are significant challenges that I think as a community, you know, there are groups that are bringing together all, all the uh, providers and payers to look at the opioid epidemic dementia. And I think we should be very proud of that. And, Certainly some of the new state uh, statutes uh, will help us along with that as well. So the way I think about, you know, what are the two most important opportunities and challenges? I think one of the biggest challenges is provider burnout, you know, burnout of physicians and advanced practice uh, providers. Um, because of all the opportunities and because of all the challenges we're facing, you know, commonly they discuss feeling like a cog in a big machine, um, not having a voice, and really being burdened with clerical and bureaucratic tasks. There was a recent Med, uh, Medscape survey that suggested that up to 60% of physicians may have some symptoms of burnout. I think the significant opportunity, though, lies in provider engagement and provider alignment. And a lot of times those are used interchangeably, but I think they are different. Alignment really is critical to addressing the needs of the present, you know, the present opportunities and challenges, and that's the result of good management. I think, though, true provider engagement, though, is, is really critical to address future needs, and that's really the result of strong leadership. And so the way we've approached both provider burnout and provider engagement is really to empower a culture where providers play a leadership role, that they lead innovation. You know, traditionally, I think providers and, and physicians, just because we have a longer history of looking at it, you know, we've asked them to play a role in clinical decisions in terms of, hey, help us design a good COPD order set, you know, or heart failure order set. But, you know, we don't want you involved in operations and we don't want you involved in marketing and IT. I think that's changed and, and we are changing that in terms of our culture as an organization, that we engage them to really play a role in operations, IT, marketing. I'm just gonna show a, one example of that. You know, we, we've been working on a number of service lines. Um, cerebral vascular care is a, a passion for us, and we've developed, I think, a world-class team of physicians and advanced practice providers. And we've really engaged them to build this, and, and they have. And so they have been very integral, not just on the clinical side, but in terms of marketing. You know, you'll see a lot of billboards from us around the city, but um, all of these have had really significant leadership from our providers and how they're designed, what media that they're put into. And I think they find this very liberating. And then in terms of operations, you know, how, how we actually look at cerebrovascular patients in the hospital, 
you know, utilizing inpatient services, really staffed by advanced practice providers, ref, you know, building a referral line, and then even the helicopter. This is something as, a, as an executive I was sort of hesitant on. There's cost, there's a lot of resources that go into it, but our provider leaders were relentless, and, and they made this work, and they operationalize it. Um, and whether it's doing that or, or really putting together a national uh, conference, uh, this is how we've really engaged our providers, to engage them and hopefully also to help you know, prevent burnout. But at the end of the day, it's all about the patient. And uh, you know, this is a, a case of a 52-year-old female who woke up really pretty much paralyzed on the left side. And the timeline's important because her husband last saw her well at one in the morning and she was brought to the ED close to nine in the morning. Now, TPA, the clot-busting drug, is really to be used up to 4.5 hours after last known well. Well, we know now from recent studies just published this fall, the DAWN trial among others, that interventional treatment of stroke is effective up to 24 hours post last known well. And so, you know, our, our physicians went in and used an innovative take technique that they're going to publish, but they sucked out the clot, and this patient walked home, or not walked home, but went home <laughs> walking uh, after only two days. And so I think that's what it's all about. We want to engage providers to build and, and also really engage them so that we can help prevent burnout. So thank you. to move this up a little bit. Um, well, welcome everybody. Um, I'm really pleased to be here to give you some of my thoughts about healthcare this morning. Uh, I'm the business guy. I'm your employer representative this morning. And I want to talk about how we've approached uh, healthcare uh, at Irwin Seating Company. Uh, and then I'll also make a number of general comments about healthcare in America. And uh, mainly because healthcare is a huge business issue. So Irwin Seating Company is a West Michigan company. We've been around for actually now 111 years. Uh, we're very proud to be a family-owned business, and we're now into the fourth generation, which doesn't include me because I'm now just the chairman of the board. We manufacture public seating for schools, universities, arenas, performing arts centers, stadiums, houses of worship, and movie theaters. Uh, what makes our business unique is that we uh, our seating and our telescopic bleachers and platforms, which we do in Illinois, are permanently attached to the building, uh, which places us both in the construction and the manufacturing industries. We employ about 550 people. We have an additional 190 people through temporary agencies. Of that number, about 430 are here in Grand Rapids, with the remaining balance being in our telescopic division uh, in Altamont, Illinois. Our revenue is now about 145 million, and we've been growing uh, in many of our markets, but especially in our manufacturing of recliners for movie theaters, folks. That's a big deal. Um, in Grand Rapids, we have a union. Uh, we've had one since 1951. Originally, the United Furniture Workers is now the CWA, the Communication Workers of America. Uh, and we recently just negotiated a new three-year contract with the union. Our practice has been to use that event to review our health care coverage for all our employees and then make some significant changes if needed. Irwin Seating Company is self-insured and, and we have a plan through Priority Health PPO. And here are a number of key tenets of our philosophy uh, which have been in place for quite a number of years. We offer a choice between a traditional 90-10 plan and a high deductible HSA. Interestingly, the union also has a third option, which is a 100% coverage plan with higher deductible and premiums, obviously, than the 90-10 plan. We charge moderate premiums for our HSA plan, but offset the majority of this cost with company contributions to individual HSAs, doing that, of course, in January so that they have a funded health savings account at the beginning of each year. Our HSA uh, participation has doubled in the last three years, so you can see that trend. Uh, annual premium increases are based heavily on historical results. 
Um, and actually, this past year, no increases for two of our three plans um, um, and, uh, due to our results in 2017. So we're doing something right. Uh, like past union contracts, um, we set a maximum of our premiums for three years. That's what you have to do with the union contract. And then if the costs are below those projections, the company and the employees split the difference and reflect it in the next year's premium. Um, we continue to offer a very uh, involved wellness incentives for individuals, uh, which are, include premium reductions for achieving certain objectives. Uh, and we now have 70% participation here in Grand Rapids. Uh, we strive to help our people become better health care consumers. Uh, an example of that is the Health Care uh, Blue Book, which offers in cash incentives, uh, which our people love, uh, for purchasing services from a fair price provider. Some ongoing challenges and opportunities for us. Um, controlling health care costs require that individuals be both good consumers and pay attention to their wellness. Not an easy thing for an employer. Not unique to Irwin, we have seen a significant increase in the number of individuals with opio opioid prescriptions. In addition to the cost, it also carries both current and future risk uh, for the company. Healthcare coverage in many cases, and this is an interesting one, is the main driver of older workers not retiring early. Uh, often these individuals obviously are less healthy and can be costly for our company to cover. Many larger companies are moving uh, an opportunity to off-site clinics, and we wonder if that might work for us even though we're a smaller company, only have 430 people. And we like this idea of telemed and that it's taking off, and we may see, see that as an opportunity to control some of our future costs. But like most employers, we found this sort of a no-win situation for, our, for our well over a decade. We're in competitive markets where almost all of our projects are suffer, uh, subject to price competition. Much of it is public bidding. Many of our competitors are located where wages and costs are lower and, than West Michigan, Mississippi, Australia, Colombia, Mexico. Nevertheless, we continue to work hard to be an employer of choice by seeking to offer above average uh, pay and benefits. So in an environment where health care costs continue to rise, we, like most employers, are trying to balance wage increases, employee health care cost sharing, and company absorption of health care costs. It's not easy, and we can't win. Our folks feel pinched uh, by the increase in health care costs or by the lack of wage increases. However, in general, I would say that we feel we're doing really well, and we're surviving. Now let me try to digress into some of my personal thoughts about health care in the United States. While I know the history of employer-sponsored health care in the United States, it doesn't make sense to me. Maybe employers should pay for health care, but finding and implementing health care plans for our employees is a significant burden. As a business, our mission is to deliver the best product to our customers, best in value, best in quality, best in service. Not surprisingly, the health care of our employees is not something our customers care about. Why have our political representatives not talked about this? Doesn't that hurt our competitiveness? In general, I would say that I'm embarrassed by the United States healthcare system, and I use that in quotes. I'm embarrassed by the fact that our costs are at least 50% more than the other developed uh, countries, nations in the world. And I love this chart, and yet you, know, you really can't see it, but there's a whole bunch of you know, countries sitting in the middle. And I looked at it, and I looked at it, and I looked at it, and I said, where in the world is the United States? And oh, 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 they're way up at the top, almost off the page, because we're that much higher than all the other countries of the world. I'm embarrassed by the fact that all this extra money going to health care, the United States is not experiencing the highest quality of health care in the world. It seems we have a long way to go in that area. As somebody th who thinks all, all the time about becoming lean, 
lean manufacturing, lean principles, lean healthcare, which is delivering higher value at the same or lower cost, I find there's no excuse for our higher healthcare costs as a nation. It's also embarrassing that healthcare costs are usually cited as the single biggest reason that individual people go bankrupt in the United States. I think that's sad, and it just doesn't seem right. I've never liked, this is a perfect one, I've never liked our present system where cost shifts come from uncompensated government and charity care toward those of us who pay a market price. We continue to see our private company costs go up as the government payers, Medicare, Medicaid, experience only modest increases and don't pay their full share. Another, ne ne another interesting negative consequence of our current system is that small companies, entrepreneurs especially, are at a disadvantage. They're too small to afford health care for their employees, which makes it hard for them to attract and keep employees who have health care issues and, and families. And that's very bad for the business climate. Some things to think about. Data shows that we do not res do a respectable job of evidence-based care. That's the concept where all, med all medical providers follow the universally accepted practices and procedures. An example comes from Dr. Gawande's book, Checklist Manifesto, one of my favorite books, uh, where he bemoans how hard it is for doctors and operating room personnel to always follow the simple checklist for surgery that was created by the World Health Organization. Years ago, uh, Mike Fried showed me a chart, and uh, let me summarize the chart. It was very interesting. Uh, when the U.S. was compared with Spain, Sweden, Germany, and the U.K., by age, our health care costs were the same in all those countries through the age of 50. We were right in the bundle. You couldn't even see any difference. However, by the age of 60, the U.S. was higher. By the age of 85, our health care costs per person are four times what they are in other countries. That led me to think and believe that maybe we have some serious costs with our Medicare system. I leave it to others to think about how we find improvements of cost there. But it also points to how much is spent at the end of life, and by all measurements, that's a lot. So, as Americans, you know, we're, we're not going to live forever either, just because we're American. We're gonna, all going to die. So we need to pay attention to the quality of life toward the end of life. It's not easy to think about that, and there's lots of people that need to be involved in that. But everyone should have a plan for the end of their life. In my family, we have, not, we have avoided high costs, and both of my parents died at home with family. And that's what they wanted, and that's what they planned for. Everybody knows our system's upside down. Providers make money when we, we spend money on health care, whether it's procedures or tests or prescriptions, etc. We have yet to find effective ways to reward, reward providers for, for keeping people healthy. Here's something to think about. I recently read an article in the National Geographic about the three happiest countries in the world. They were Denmark, Singapore, and Costa Rica. I was struck with Costa Rica. Here's the reason. This is quoting. Since 1907, Costa Rica has seen life expectancy jump from 66 to 80 years and infant mortality drop by a factor of seven. The death rate from heart disease for men is about a third less than in the United States, even though Costa Rica spends one-tenth as much per capita on health care as the United States. As former President Jose Maria Figueras told the reporter, the nation's healthcare system works so well because it aims to keep people healthy in the first place. In the US, incentives are aligned to drive up costs, he said. Here, for years, the emphasis has been on preventative 
health care system. Because quite frankly, the objective of a good health policy is for people not to get sick. A last thought. <clears throat> if 25 to 50 percent of health care costs are administrative in the United States, Think about the implications of this scenario. It's an old one that I read from T.R. Reed's book called The Healing of America, where he describes a visit, his visit, to the doctor's office in France when he was getting an opinion on his sore shoulder. If you read the book, it's, it's, a, it's a hysterical story. But nevertheless, this is a quote from him. There was something missing from the office, at least to an American's eyes. This doctor's office had no file cabinets or bookshelves loaded with patient records and bills. How could you run a medical practice without files and without bills? Answer, French patients are informed up front as to exactly how much they will pay for a medical procedure, but the card of life is the real difference. Each French patient carries a card that contains the patient's entire medical record back to 1998 with a digital record of every doctor visit, referral, injection, operation, x-ray, diagnostic test, prescription, warnings, etc., in addition to all financial records. The doctor slides it into a small reader on the top of his desk, the size of a telephone, and the patient medical records are displayed on the doctor's computer screen. Wow, the power of technology. Think of the savings. Now, we're making progress here. And as I quickly read through the healthcare uh, check data, I see that West Michigan is improving on many, many fronts. Uh, but it's already been, it's pretty obvious, our big health issues, excessive drinking, smoking, and obesity are huge, and they're very, very tough to address. Uh, I'll leave it, we can do better than that. I urge everyone here to work in any way they can to continue to make progress. There are small but important improvements, but there are also obviously big systemic opportunities. It is wonderful that Grand Valley has given us this annual tool to judge our collective progress. Thank you very much. Uh-oh, I think I'm all right here. Give me a microphone. There's no telling what'll happen. So first, uh, my first thoughts. I want to thank Win. I, I think sitting next to him and hearing his perspective on this as a successful business person is it's it's very valuable for all of us who it many times can be entrenched uh, in the healthcare side of this. The one thing that I would say, you know, two, two observations. First is um, the present situation is never random, right? It was the it was the ideal situation of people some time ago. Uh, and it's difficult to change, but we are on the cusp of changes that must occur. And I think he described it perfectly. The second fact, and one that struck me as I was approaching Kalamazoo this morning in I-94 in the snow at some ungodly hour, was that I wasn't surprised that the people of Costa Rica were much happier than I was this morning. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for those, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Nick Lyon. I'm the director of the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, I've come from Lansing. Uh, I live in Marshall. I have uh, a great affinity for this area. Um, I love this conference. I love the fact I want to thank the people at Grand Valley State University who, who have taken this on every single year and, uh, and really are, are leaders in this field. And I want to thank them for educating our young professionals of the future because we do have some shortages coming as, as our people uh, age, uh, both um, um, the consumer side and the provider side. We're going to need people that uh, can take care of us. So thank you for that. Um, in the introduction, we talked a bit about Healthy Michigan. I talk about Healthy Michigan all the time um, here. Uh, I think I want to kind of take it today and then and talk a little bit about the success and why we did it, because I think it fits into a little bit of what Wynn said, um, and also the risks to Healthy Michigan that are coming out of um, Washington, D.C. Um, first and foremost, uh, in this area alone, 650,000 people are covered in the state by the Healthy Michigan Plan. Uh, when we designed the program, 
Uh, we took the opportunity, the Affordable Care Act, that had many provisions, right? It was thousands and thousands of pages that supposedly many congressmen and senators didn't read. Um, and they probably didn't. But I think uh, um, many opportunities in that, one of it was to expand uh, Medicaid health insurance coverage uh, for, those, for adults who weren't previously covered. And um, Michigan took advantage of it. Uh, it took us a little while, but it also gave us an opportunity to design a very unique system where we were building incentives and carrots into the provider community and to consumers um, in an effort to address many of the things that have been discussed here today. Um, just a few of the stats coming out of it. Uh, we've seen 60% uh, of individuals around Healthy Michigan uh, have seen a primary care visitor, had a primary care visit, which was something that was um, severely lacking in the population before. 70% contacted a primary care physician before visiting an emergency room. Many of the stats that you'll see today talk about emergency room utilization. Uh, it's no secret that the emergency room is the most expensive place to seek services. If we can, you know, for, for two reasons. One, it's, it's, you have to respond to the emergent situation uh, in a way that, it, that you can't in a primary care physician's office. And two, by the time somebody goes to the emergency room, they view it as an emergency. Uh, so many conditions that uh, otherwise could be prevented or treated uh, end up becoming a potentially life-threatening situation. Uh, I you know, use the example of a diabetes patient who years before didn't have insurance, didn't take care of themselves. And by the time they finally go to the emergency room for a circulation problem, you know, rather than talking about a pill, which I'll come back to pharmacy costs, or rather than talking about a pill, or even better yet, getting ahead of it years earlier and potentially changing their diet, increasing physical activity, both of which are incentives in the Healthy Michigan Plan for Individuals, by the way. Um, they're going to the emergency room where they might be talking about um, you know, an amputation, for example. So, so this is you know, life-impacting services for people who need it. And, and, I, and I give great credit uh, to the state legislature, uh, to Governor Snyder, to former Director Jim Havenman, who's here, uh, who took great leadership positions um, when it wasn't necessarily popular, especially in the majority party of the state, to take uh, those positions. And I think it's proven to be quite successful. Um, one of the um, one of the interesting things when I talk a little bit about um, the threat coming from Washington D.C. and and there's a lot of talk about um, repealing Obamacare. Uh, that turned after President Trump was elected. That turned very much into a conversation around reform around the Medicaid program, and potentially modifying um, the expansion population, which is Healthy Michigan. The federal government pays for. And long term commitments, ninety percent of the costs for Healthy Michigan. Um, for the traditional Medicaid program, the federal government pays about two out of every three dollars. So the cost of converting Healthy Michigan to a traditional Medicaid program would be about eight hundred million dollars of the state. Uh, in West Michigan, in these four counties, Healthy Michigan's three hundred forty million dollars of services that come into these four counties. Um, so. You know, a lot of talk around reform and what can we do. Uh, I think pretty early on in the conversation, um, it became apparent that a straight uh, pulling away of the Medicaid expansion wouldn't be supported by many of the states, especially those that expanded. Imagine that. And, uh, and the costs were such that they were looking for, for trying to do something with the program. So there's a lot of talk that came around reforming the Medicaid program as a whole. Uh, I think there are opportunities there. Uh, many of the things that have been talked about here today, um, the paperwork, the lack of coordination, uh, certainly applies uh, to what states have to do to get approval from the federal government to operate these programs. Um, that said, I think it would be very difficult to glean the sort of savings that they wanted to achieve um, by, um, by reform. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's much of a secret, or at least it's my political belief that part of the rationale for um, um, reducing health care expenditures, the government-sponsored health care expenditures through Medicaid was an attempt to potentially um, um, offset part of the revenue decreases that came from the tax cuts that were enacted. The tax cuts happened. The expenditure cuts didn't. Someday that bill's got to come due. And I think that's going to be a very difficult day uh, for those who receive the most amount of money uh, from government, and certainly healthcare providers are part of that group. 
um, one of the lost, uh, one of the you know, one of the lost um, pieces around Healthy Michigan was was um, our goal to decrease uncompensated care. And the hospitals that reported finance, finance reports in the first year or two, 50% decrease in uncompensated care. That's not healthy Michigan. Uh, I'm surprised by the lack of insurance still. When we started looking at those numbers and people who are struggling with access to health care, um, they're actually at times in high deductible plans and can't afford those high deductibles. And the payments are due to them when they receive services. It's also something that I'm kind of watching a little bit, it's sort of shifting what uncompensated care was about. Before it was about somebody who walked into an ER, walked into a hospital, had no insurance coverage at all. Now it's bad debt. And uh, this shift is something that I think is going to be very interesting in the hospital community. Many people view the hospitals as the big winners under uh, these Medicaid expansions, and, and they're not wrong. Hospitals did do quite well. But it's forgotten that you know, anytime you squeeze a balloon, it might, you know, you're going to have costs to squeeze out elsewhere. And I think this is part of it. Second part of it is uh, um, hospitals gave up a lot in that bill. Um, there's Medicare payment reforms and, and Medicare uh, dish reductions, for example, that, that aren't thought of. And in Michigan, if we, uh, if we, if we went back to pre-Healthy uh, Michigan expenses, uh, Healthy Michigan funded much of the behavioral health services that were previously provided by general fund expenses in the state. It actually, the amount we saved in community mental health general funding uh, exceeds what we're paying for Healthy Michigan still today. So we would actually have to put more general fund back into our budget to cover the mental health services that are provided pre-Healthy Michigan if, uh, if a straight repeal happened and we wanted to see the same mental health services as before, which I think we all do. Um, to still some struggling. Anytime you're shifting programs um, from a general fund state program to something that's Medicaid that has a lot of restrictions around it, uh, the rules of that program follow the money, of course, and, and we're seeing some difficulties in some areas of the state, including here in West Michigan. Uh, the struggles here, um, as we push towards reform of our prepaid admission health plans, which are behavioral health providers for substance use, and how that money flows to the community mental health providers, uh, we still are pushing for decreasing in the administrative layers, trying to drive efficiency, et cetera. But that's a small dollar decrease relative to what we're talking of some of the um, reductions happening out of Washington, D.C. Another um, important piece of Healthy Michigan is that it covers much, much of the uh, opioid um, epidemic expenses is covered by the Healthy Michigan plan. $118 million of, of treatment, detox, uh, inpatient residential services uh, are covered by Medicaid and Healthy Michigan. So if we're talking about um, doing something around the opioid epidemic and we have to, more than 60,000 people died last year in this country, more than the Vietnam War um, died last year from, from addiction to opioids and heroin and, and other related substances. Uh, that's something that we still uh, have to take into consideration as any of these things happen. Some of the, we did receive other grant fundings, but it's it's a fraction of it. It's It's, $16 million compared to you know building the treatment into our uh, existing framework, which is so necessary. Uh, opioids affect everything, as, as we're all learning. As I've, it, it, I have um, the old social services part, the human services part of the department as well, so I have child welfare. And, and as I've talked to tribal leaders, for example, I had a meeting with tribal leaders, and, and when they interface with the child welfare system, it was like, what percentage of people have uh, an opioid issue? You know, someone would tell me 90, 95%, right? In the Upper Peninsula, one of my local workers told me that it's, it's, it's predominant of majority of families are being affected by this. Um, we have other, you know, everything that we talk about too, you know, we, we, the revenue projections came out for the state. We're in a stable situation. General fund projections barely decreased. School aid fund barely increased. But don't make that um, an optimism for stability and funding. Um, the governor and the legislature have um, committed to funding um, future roads projects in the tune of $850 million three years out and um, a tax, uh, tax credit of some sort um, that's about $100 million as well. So we're going to see constrained general fund revenues in the state too moving forward that's going to make funding many of these programs difficult. So. Uh, that said, you know, from, from my perspective, there are many opportunities to do some of the things that we've talked about today. 
uh, I think preventive services is key regardless of, of where we're at. And, and again, addressing some of these high cost um, illnesses uh, will help uh, yield better results in the future. Um, we have a state innovation model design grant comes out of the ACA that uh, certainly pushes us towards value-based payments. Um, that reform is going to continue. Uh, there are opportunities around integration. I talked about behavioral health and physical health, but we have efforts going on in the department that uh, where we're aligning all of our services, um, whether it's food assistance, um, um, utility assistance in the wintertime for people in state emergency relief, uh, things that people go into our local offices to receive services along with behavioral health care, substance use services, potentially WIC, um, and other things they walk into the public health department for. And if we can coordinate uh, these programs and help people get back on their feet that much faster, uh, we believe that we have an opportunity uh, to provide benefit to the taxpayers going forward. Thank you. Okay, we have some questions. Nick, there's two questions on mental health. Um, what can be done in our region to ensure that we have adequate funding for community mental health programs and services? And another question says we're 97 million short. Well, I, the $97 million figure is a statewide figure. Uh, like I said, it's a smaller amount here that people are pointing at. Uh, I'm not surprised by the question. Uh, there, I think there's two factors that come into play here. Um, one is really bureaucratic, and I'll probably have a lot of fun trying to explain it. Um, but the first is simpler, which is if it's a Medicaid-provided required service, it has to be provided. Um, com asserting, I was able to use a word that was more positive, asserting that the rate isn't sufficient to cover the services is not an excuse to cut the service, period. Um, prepaid inpatient health plans, uh, much like Medicaid, physical health plans have reserves that can be tapped into for situations where the rates uh, are not sufficient. Um, the, the, the law is set up so that there's cost sharing between the state and the locals uh, if we go over a certain threshold. And, um, and, they ha and rates have to be actually sound, so in future years those rates can be adjusted. I do think there's an issue statewide, though, around Healthy Michigan. The Healthy Michigan rate, because um, the population wasn't disabled, uh, it's a much less, it's a, it's a lower rate that goes out for behavioral health than uh, the traditional prior age blind and disabled rate. And I think a little bit of what's going on is with Healthy Michigan, um, we, we were able to implement basically, a, well, we were required to implement a simpler application process where there is an, inc there is an asset verification that wasn't allowed. Um, the income verification is very simple. If a person is disabled, that is a much harder application process. So I think there's a bit of a, there's, I don't know how to address that yet. Is, is there something we can do in our local offices or something the community mental health agencies can be doing to assure that if somebody's disabled, that then they're being identified as disabled so we get the higher rate and they get the higher rate. So I think that's part of it as well. Um, but, but again, statewide, uh, we're at a time of change when it comes to these types of services. Thank you. Um, Wynn, a couple questions on this, so I'll kind of wrap them together. What is your ideal solution regarding your employing health and wellness? And how do you feel yours is working, basically? Well, I think what, what we've got is really good. Um, but 70% 70, 70 participation rate doesn't work. Uh, everybody knows that it's the other 30 that are the bigger issues. Uh, the people that come in and check their blood pressure and uh, and uh, do they hold it for the holidays events and all the other things that we do uh, and, and go through and see the doctor and all, do everything else. Um, that's fabulous, but you all know better than I do that this the chronic disease, I think that's a really weird terminology for it, but um, it's the people that have the things that we just talked about, uh, particularly the overweight people. And I'm not sure, I don't have a, a total solution for that. Um, you know, I, I think we have to keep moving at it um, what one of the things that years and years ago, University of Michigan uh, doc, I think it was, but he had he had a mantra uh, about wellness programs, which I thought was absolutely the way to talk about. And we try to do this, but it's hard. And he said, what you really need to do, you got all these health risk factors, and there's like 14 of them. But the the key thing you want to tell people is don't get worse. <laughs> don't get worse. So you may have three factors right now, but don't add a fourth and a fifth. 
And that is such a different approach to wellness, and, and we suffer from it. Other, it's all these healthy people doing exercise and going to the club and all that other stuff. Well, you know, that's not real. That's not going to get at the people that need to, to begin to look at their, their own wellness, and, and, and they need to take control of it at the end of the day. Um, but we're moving toward the HSA. We're moving toward uh, more people on wellness, but it's a tough, tough nut. You know, and I, I don't know, you get into people's individual lifestyles and, and uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm not the kind of a, I'm a civil libertarian, so I wouldn't impose upon that, but we sure are gonna create incentives for them to live up to taking care of themselves. Thank you. Um, Dr. Hahn, in relation to healthcare lab the, the healthcare labor market opportunity, what are your thoughts about ways current roles can better um, function more fluidly across healthcare sites and systems to meet the needs um, and ability to add more staff. For example, they say, more people don't always result in better outcomes. Example, in patients and experiences, sometimes you have frustration because they don't, people don't talk to each other. I think as uh, health systems, we have to do a better job in terms of um, having our folks, whether they be advanced practice providers, respiratory therapists, uh, really practice at the top of their license and really give them the freedom to participate uh, in, a, in a very meaningful way in care. I think that's, that's really the way we think about it, that uh, you know, physicians are really one uh, fairly small aspect of that workforce and we really need to really have everybody really practice to the top of their license, do whatever they can and, and to fully engage them. Good. Nick, what are your initial thoughts on work requirements for Medicaid? You know, I'm not, I'm not averse to requirements. Um, I, I think that you have to be careful that we don't put barriers in place uh, that cause greater problems for individuals. Uh, but we have work requirements in our cash assistance program. Um, if there's flexibility, I think we're, we're, it could be used um, towards education as well. I think that's something that can be valuable. Uh, my concern is that I know how labor intensive work requirements are. And we have, we have to balance this a little bit. You know, it, it's, we all, we all talk about integrity in the programs and I'm sure hospitals can, you know, struggle with this sometimes too, but nobody wants to put the people in the place to ensure the integrity. So do we want to make the investment on the administrative side we talk about to ensure that uh, people are doing these types of work requirements because uh, with any federal program, uh, the auditing and the checking and, and the ensuring that we're doing it properly, uh, it, it can be uh, quite zealous at times. So I, th I think, it's, I, I think it, it provides an incentive for people to improve their lives. I think if the child care uh, situation's in place, it can be applied, um, um, you know, I don't know broadly is the right word, uh, and, and I think it's something that we're going to look at in this state uh, quite carefully over the next, um, over the next few months. And, and uh, I appreciate, I, I think what it signals, uh, which is a really, which is a decent thing, really good thing, is flexibility from the federal government uh, in ways that states can implement the programs that they think can best serve those that we want to serve. Um, there are potential harms that come out of um, work requirements too, and, and it's not just a panacea, and I think it's something that has to be balanced um, with the potential negative impacts on the programs and the people. But again, I, I think in certain instances, um, um, there's an expectation or that um, people should be moving in the right direction, uh, and that's, that's one piece of it. Are you familiar with the PHIT Act legislation put for money, putting fishing for money in your HSA up to 2000 to be used for wellness related purchases, products, mem memberships. How are organizations in West Michigan organizing to push this forward? I'm not, I'm not aware of it. Okay. Nope. Just, just, just to comment on the, this whole work requirement stuff, um, it's probably a little bit of much ado about nothing. Um, I mean, we need, we need people working um, negative incentives probably don't work, and we need to think long and hard. And I think uh, healthcare and a whole bunch of the, the safety net systems are, are not are not designed for work, and, um, and and we need not only people to 
to work, but also people with the skills that can uh, fill all those jobs that are out there. We don't actually have a jobs problem. We have a skill problem. And, um, and, and the, cri the critical thing is, how do you get those people that aren't contributing to the economy to contribute to the economy? I don't think by negative things you're going to get there. You've got to figure out how you create incentives and how you change some of these goofy laws and regulations and cliff effects and all other kinds of things that prevent people from working. You know, so um, I, I listened on the way over here to, you know, there was a, it was a Republican who was talking about how he really well liked this new thing, and I'm like, and I started listening to him, I listened to him, I listened to him, and I said, this is a bureaucratic nightmare. And here we go again. Administrative costs are 20, 25%, you know, or 25%, somewhere around there, of all of healthcare, and gosh, here we go again. We're gonna create more bureaucracy. Well, that doesn't help anybody. I'm a business guy. Let's, let's create value for people and pay people for good work, and that's what we really need to be focusing on, and sometimes I think we just, we just don't think about that. Uh, so as a, as a lean thinker, a lean government thinker, either, so watch what you do, because sometimes the consequences uh, don't, don't really get where you, where you want. And I think, and I think that, um, I think that you, 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 you captured it quite accurately here, both of the administrative costs, what's going on. And then you think about what we're really talking about, which is able-bodied uh, working adults, which isn't where the large chunk of expenditures for Medicaid or Medicare is for healthcare in this country. You go back to what you said earlier, which is it's when we get old. It's it, you know it's 60 and beyond. And I don't think, well, the federal law wouldn't require it, but I don't think any of us are thinking that we're going to pull somebody out of a nursing home and make them work, right? So I think there's got to be there's got to be some some thought on how, and, and it's not suggested, so I don't want to say that it is, but. Um, <laughs> So, but that's, that's sort of the, the feeling is, you know, we have 2.3 million people in the state that are on, um, on Medicaid or Healthy Michigan. So, you know, that, that is a large number. And you start narrowing it down to people who we would consider um, able to work, uh, that number just, um, shrinks quite a bit. And the other thing, too, is with Healthy Michigan, a large number of those people are working. You know, we have something in the state called ALICE, right? They, they do these reports <laughs> United Way does. Asset Limited, Income Constrained Employed. Yep, and, uh, and they put together a chart of how much they think people need to make to survive, right? And they, they consider food and health care and transportation, which is a significant issue for people who are looking for work and for skills. And uh, the base pay that they say, it, it, the basic needs pay is $56,000 a year for a family of four. And I think that's, that's something that, that needs to be considered, too, as we look at this population. And you're exactly right. What can we do as a civil libertarian? You might say nothing, but what can we do as a government to, uh, well, to work with the Michigan Works agencies and things like that so we can get the skills out there to the people who need them so that, that firms looking to hire people can do it? Well, think, think big picture. Think, think a little bit about what we just talked about, all these health care costs. And obviously, I'm big on the cost thing. I've always been the cost is first, access second. Uh, we got that wrong, but that's that's another story. But um, but but think about that a little bit because what was I talking about? We like to give people more money. Most employers would like to be able to do that, but when you're sacked with health care costs, more health care costs, more health care, is that hurting the middle class in the United States? Is that preventing? Is that in increasing more Alice folk? Yeah, it is. It's not helping folks. So health care is a problem in multiple ways. And unless we someday come across this, we're, you know, some crisis is gonna happen that, that we don't wanna think about. Um, but yep. it, it is a bigger issue than we realize because we can't give our people more money because we've gotta take care of their health care. And I think 40% 40, 40 of, of, of Michigan's families are, are Alice, considered Alice or below. Um, 15 of that 40% are poverty. And we know that many of our people who are in the, under the poverty level are working. So you're talking the vast majority of, of working people are poor. And I think you make a very good point. How do we get people into the, how do we increase their skills? How do we get them into higher paid jobs? And then what barriers are out there uh, that, are, that are stopping businesses from doing that? Well, let's give our panelists a round of applause. If you didn't get your question answered, maybe you can talk to them after this uh, presentation. Um, thank you for coming. I wanted to point out that we do have our next healthcare economic, or the forums, the West Michigan Healthcare Forums on opioid epidemic on Friday, February 2nd. Have a good day and drive safely.